والآن ننتقل معكم متابعينا إلى الضيف الثاني في هذه الحلقة وهو السيد ألكسندر لونغ لويس الكاتب والمحلل السياسي الأمريكي ينضم إلينا من واشنطن أهلا وسهلا بك سيد ألكسندر ضيفي في حلقة اليوم وأبدأ بسؤال عن تهديدات الرئيس أردوغان الأخيرة بشن هجمات ضد الشمال السوري ما مدى واقعية هذا الطرح التركي في ظل المعارضة الأمريكية الشديدة لمثل هذه الهجمات تحديدا في عهد الرئيس جو بايدن Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, yeah, so the the recent statements from from Erdogan are very interesting, to say the least. Uh, if, as you recall, the last fall, there was a similar kind of push within Turkey to uh, commence commence a new operation into northern Syria following the death of two uh, Turkish, um, Turkish um, police officers in northern Syria, likely at the hands of the YPG. Um, or other rebel Kurdish elements, if you will. Um, at that time, it was very difficult for Turkey to seriously, um, you know, commit to any new offensive in the country because it needed either the approval of the United States or Russia, Russia being west of the Euphrates, the United States for the most part being east of the Euphrates. Um, and Turkey had a hard time getting approval for those, for a new offensive in either of those areas. And so if you look today, I don't feel that a lot of those dynamics have changed. It's, it's, there, there are a lot of new dynamics in Syria. The war in Ukraine has changed many, many things. Um, and uh, the, uh, the new NATO process for Finland and Sweden certainly plays a role there in terms of what Erdogan may think he can get out of this in terms of a concession um, in Syria. Whether or not he's tying a new offensive or perhaps gaining some new ground in Syria to allowing those two countries into NATO, I think remains to be seen. It could be a possibility. But um, in the end of the day, um, you know, the, really what Erdogan is thinking here, I think, is how he, can he get a concession in some way, shape or form. Um, in the end of the day, I think that some dynamics on the ground have changed in terms of where Russia stands in terms of its engagement in Syria. Um, I still don't necessarily think Russia would be open to any kind of land swap based on Turkish threats of a uh, new offensive, although I'm sure they would like to take out uh, Kurdish elements in areas like Manbij. Um, but in terms of Northeast Syria, especially with the U.S.'s uh, recent, uh, you know, sanctions waivers and other signals that it is very supportive of the SDF and the AANES, I don't see the U.S. giving Turkey any kind of exception in any way, shape or form, just as I don't think it did in, in the last fall and fall 2021. And so um, in the end of the day, this uh, it could be Erdogan bluffing. It could be that he sees an opportunity to do something with the Russians, perhaps distracted. At this point, it's perhaps a little too early to tell, although I lean more into the the fact that I don't think Erdogan has enough influence and power to really do what he's claiming he wants to do in northern Syria in terms of a new offensive, just because enough dynamics on the ground have not changed outside of that Russian element, I believe. Um, نعم ألكسندر نعرف أن الرئيس جو بايدن من أيام الحملة الانتخابية وهو ينتقد الرئيس السابق دونالد ترامب بشكل لاذع بسبب الهجوم التركي ضد شمال شرق سوريا وضد قوات سوريا الديمقراطية ولكن مثل ما حضرتك ذكرت يعني حتى في المرة الأولى أمريكا أو, أو تركيا لم تأخذ فعليا ضوء أخضر من الجانب الأمريكي لشن مثل هذه الهجمات ماذا لو قررت تركيا من جديد أن تقوم بشن هجمات دون ضوء أخضر أمريكي ما هي ردود الفعل المحتمله من اداره الرئيس جو بايدن؟ Um so with respect to if Erdogan were to just commence to an offensive regardless um I I think you would see a pretty heavy-handed response not only in the US Congress to pressure the executive but also you would I would not be surprised to see a pretty heavy response from the Biden administration themselves um which this is where it gets difficult right because the US needs Turkey in in support its efforts in Ukraine and I think Erdogan knows this that being said I still don't think Just given U.S. actions and U.S. support for the Kurds in the Northeast, uh, it, I find it very difficult to believe that the U.S. would tolerate something like this, regardless of what's happening in Ukraine. And I don't think Erdogan has the power to necessarily to, to take that risk. Um, I, you could see sanctions, perhaps on the defense industry in a deeper way. Um, I don't know what beyond that necessarily. Um, but again, the, the presence of U.S. troops in Northeast Syria in and of itself I, 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 would, I would hope, <laughs> I, I think at least, um, really limits what Erdogan can realistically do, because I don't think Erdogan's going to be willing to risk putting U.S. forces at risk, a NATO allies forces at risk, you know, in northeast Syria without U.S. approval first, which is, again, why I think anything east of the Euphrates is much less likely than west, um, um, given, given Russia's, you know, um, preoccupation with Ukraine.
Um, but in a in a potential scenario in which Erdogan does go into Northeast, I think you would see a pretty heavy-handed response from the U.S. government, not it, it, not just the executive, but probably the Congress as well, who's already not a huge fan of Erdogan in a number of respects and hasn't liked some of the Biden administration's recent efforts to perhaps clean up some of those relations in support of its efforts in Ukraine. نعم سيد ألكسندر أيضا من النتائج الأخرى على الحرب السورية على الأراضي السورية للحرب في أوكرانيا هي أن روسيا قامت بسحب بعض فرق فرقها العسكرية من الأراضي السورية هل يغير هذا من شكل الاستقرار الحالي ولو كان النسبي في الأراضي السورية خاصة أن سحب القوات الروسية يعني أن حزب الله وميليشيات مرتبطة بإيران هي من يملأ الفراغ هل يأتي هل يأتي هذا بالمزيد من التصعيد الإسرائيلي المزيد من القصف الإسرائيلي على الأراضي السورية؟ Yeah, so the great question, and this is a dynamic that I think uh, people following Syria should be tracking very closely, um, given Russia's influence in the country and what that means if they decrease that influence by moving assets out. And so, kind of as a you know a slight backdrop, we've seen you know Russian forces leaving certain military bases or encampments or you know supply depots, if you will. In a number of areas, for example, in the Aleppo Naira military port and the Mahin military depots in eastern Homs. And so um, these are a couple of pretty important areas in terms of Russian kind of power projection. And the IRGC gaining control of those areas is substantial um, for a number of reasons. One, because it gives them a foothold in areas that perhaps the Russians may have been trying to prevent them from having too much power in, but also because it opens it up for the fourth division led by Assad's brother, Meher, uh, to work with the IRGC in these areas more deeply. And they are already actually doing that, opening up 11 new bases in the coming months um, in East Hama and East Helms, um, which is, in my opinion, a very clear projection of power um, and very direct, closely uh, tied to uh, Russia's a uh, decision to pull out some troops and kind of readjust its 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 force posture um, due to issues in Ukraine. And so do I think this is permanent? I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think it, the outcome in Ukraine it matters a lot here. I think Russia is heavily invested in Syria. It's been heavily invested in Syria for decades. Um, and I think that um, although some might disagree, I think that Russia prefers to have more influence than Iran in Syria in a number of aspects. And so at the same time, it is knowingly giving influence through hard assets in these areas to the IRGC and to Iran and Iran-backed militias, right? And so um, in the end of the day, I think there's probably a cost kind of benefit analysis here in terms of they're, 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 they understand um, that they're going to be losing some influence and potentially permanently, but they don't want to probably give up too much because they probably would like to return to Syria and make sure that their gains are actually real realized in the future, um, which is why you probably won't see huge pullouts by any means. You know, I mean, the Russians still value um, their 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 sea base for Mediterranean projection, power projection, um, amongst other things, including some air bases. Although they did give up the uh, Palmyra. Palmyra uh, uh, airport, which was a pretty significant uh, decision given Russian efforts against the Islamic State in the Syrian Badaya. So um, I, I, it's, I think it's developing quickly. Um, I wouldn't say that Russia is not going to try to come back and keep the influence it has, but it's definitely um, it's definitely ceding a lot of ground to Iran right now in some of the decisions that it's making. And the IRGC is very aware of this and is making a lot of moves uh, to, to, to make sure it can cement its own power. Yes, Alexander, you wrote about the relationship with Dimashq, which is a relationship that is paid for the Arab countries to avoid the influence of the Iran and the Turkey on the Syrian areas. Is it possible to achieve the Arab countries in order to achieve this relationship that you have left? روسيا تتركه الحرب في أوكرانيا في سوريا أم أن أن لإيران وتركيا حظوظ أكبر بالسيطرة؟ I'm personally very skeptical. I think that the Iranians are very entrenched in Syria. I think that Assad is not someone that's going to look very kindly on a number of Arab states suddenly coming back to be friends. Although he will take a win, a diplomatic win when he can get it. Um, and so that's why you're seeing some some renormalization, some rapprochement, or whatever you want to call it between some Arab states and 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 Assad. But I don't know if this is going to effectively diminish Iranian power in a way that some of these states, I think, hope, and uh, even with economic influence. Um, you, now, you, I think what speaks to this is, you know, the day that the Russians invade Ukraine, Ali Mamluk meets Ali Shamkani and in Tehran, and they discuss regional developments in Syria. 
that is a pretty strong show that they are interested in their relationship with Iran. Assad's visit to Tehran um, recently in the last week or two, I believe, is another symbol of their ties to Iran. And the reason that they mention resistance so much in these meetings and the post meeting statements and this it is an ideological component that that is connecting these two countries. Um, whether or not that's entirely realistic is besides the point of strategic. And I think that um, the Arab states and Israel may think that they can try to pull Syria away. Israel, I think, is probably a little more cynical in this regard, which is why you've seen the airstrikes increase in Syria since Ukraine was invaded. Um, but but um, I, I think that Arab states have perhaps too much confidence in their ability to use economic power to pull Assad away from Iran at this point. I just don't know how realistic of a strategy that is. نعم إذا اعتبرنا أن إيران ستكون صاحبة الحصة الأكبر الحصة الدولية الأكبر في الأراضي السورية إذا ما قررت روسيا التخفيف من وجودها على الأراضي السورية كيف ممكن أن تستجيب إيران أو تكون ردود فعل إيران للتهديدات التركية باقتطاع أراضي جديدة من سوريا؟ um, I'm sure that they would react um, accordingly. I don't know. Um, in terms of strategically, I mean, every time you see a Turkish incursion, if you will, into Syria, you typically see the Kurds going to talk to Assad and trying to ensure, at least recently, to ensure their protection. And so, um, you know, whether or not the Iranians see that as a value, I could see where they could see that as a value um, in which, in which, you know, as the war slowly ends and Assad consolidates power through talks with these other groups, perhaps that could be good to them. Although I also think Iran benefits in uh, a chaotic space. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think that Turkey gaining more control of northern areas and trying to, I don't know, create, perhaps pacify is the wrong word, but uh, create stability in those areas may not be good to Iran because they also won't have as much influence in those areas as well. But I, in all honesty, I think that when it comes to Turkey's, in Turkey's invasion of Iran, I don't know if that's quite the focus as much as them ensuring that they can create and sustain their own power in the areas under their control now. Although I'm sure they would prefer Assad take control of the country and not have Turkey occupy northern areas. Naam, shukran lak daifi Alexander Longlois kunta ma'ana min Washington. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Wa fil khitam, shukran likul mutabi'i Washington Online. Alqaikum fi halaqa jadida al-usbu'a al-muqbil ila liqa'a.